You're listening to Hear Arizona. Addressing issues, empowering our community. About 56 times every hour, a law enforcement officer somewhere in Arizona will file a misdemeanor charge against someone. For some people, this will amount to a small fine or probation. For others, it could lead to a loss of employment, loss of housing, loss of their possessions, all without a serious opportunity to defend themselves in court. We don't really hear much about misdemeanors. They're the minor crimes, the minor wrongdoings, the offenses less serious than felonies. The ones that don't get gavel-to-gavel coverage on TV. The ones without a packed courtroom full of reporters. Misdemeanors are generally punished by less than one year in jail. More often than not, they're punished with fines, probation, and community service. They can include a wide range of offenses, from loitering and petty shoplifting to domestic assault, criminal damage, and DUI. They also include so-called order maintenance offenses, like trespassing, disorderly conduct, public drunkenness, and vagrancy. Crimes where the only victim might be the person calling to complain about the homeless person sleeping in their alley. As a society, we don't take them as seriously as we take felonies. The smaller, less serious punishments, lack of a victim, and sheer volume of misdemeanor cases makes them really easy to ignore. They don't make for big headlines but they do make big impacts on the people who get caught up in the system. For a person with means, a misdemeanor conviction is at worst an inconvenience. They can afford a fine, legal fees, and whatever probation might cost. But for the nearly one-third of Americans who are one missed paycheck or unexpected expense away from homelessness, a simple misdemeanor could be what puts them on the street. And for those who are already on the streets, A misdemeanor charge is often what keeps them from ever finding stability. To be an unsheltered homeless individual in Phoenix means that almost all of your behaviors are criminalized. In this episode, we'll speak with Ben McJunkin, a criminal law professor at the Sandra Day O'Connor College of Law at Arizona State University. Right now, he's in the middle of a large-scale research project examining the misdemeanor system and its effect on the homeless population. Went to court, and I was going to go, and I called my case manager, and I said... I don't have any gas money. I can't drive there. I need transportation to court. I reminded her four times, and she did not get me there on time. We'll also hear from Carolyn Moore. She got involved with the misdemeanor system after a fight with her neighbor. She ended up homeless because of it, and it took more than a year for her to find any stability. People would often come in and say, I can't pay my fines. My license is suspended, but I can't pay the fine. I can't pay the fine because I don't have any money. I don't have any money because I can't get a job, and I can't get a job because I can't drive, and I can't drive because I don't have a license. And so they have this knot, and we were able to help untie that knot, and we helped hundreds of people. Public defenders like David Ward represent people like Moore every day in municipal courts across the state. On this episode of Unsheltered, we discuss the knots that people find themselves tied in when they are caught in the web of the misdemeanor justice system. Things were going pretty good for Carolyn Moore. She had her life together. I was a hotel general manager and I was making 60 grand a year at one time, you know? And I mean, I bought a, bought a brand new house, had it built, you know, watch it, had a nice uh, brand new car, all this kind of stuff. It's different for her now. We met in her small central Phoenix apartment in March, right before the pandemic shut everything down. Would you like something to drink? Oh, that's okay. Some Coke or that's something? Okay. Thank you, though. Okay. Um, so <clears throat> I guess we'll start with, uh, can you tell For me her, this know? small apartment and her 10 cats are the best she's been able to do since her misdemeanor assault charge. She got into an argument with her neighbors, an argument that escalated into shoving. So they came over one day, three of them came upstairs to my apartment. I'm still healing from this surgery. I mean, I had a full hard custom body cast and everything. I had to be in a hospital bed, everything. They came over and started calling me all names I won't repeat, threatening me. They were going to hurt me and all this. And I had to push the lady out of my door to protect myself. 
you know, so I could call the police. I was so scared, I couldn't even figure out how to dial 911. I mean, that's how. Stressful situation. I ended up with the assault. For pushing her out of the way? Yep. I couldn't believe that. I don't even have a traffic ticket. I couldn't believe that. Carolyn is an example of how the misdemeanor system can ruin lives over minor, low-level offenses. She ended up losing everything and living out of her car for almost a year as a direct result of her prosecution. Those who are already homeless are often subjected to even more scrutiny. Since they live on the streets, everything they do is in the public eye. Public defender David Ward, who represents indigent clients in misdemeanor cases in the Phoenix Municipal Court, breaks misdemeanors involving the homeless population down into two distinct classes. One is the, the crime of activity. You know, if you go in and you steal something at a store, um, or if you break something or you get in a fight on the street, okay, well, that's, that's one thing you might get charged with shoplifting. And we can argue about whether or not you know, you're hungry and you steal food. We can argue about the morality of that, but the legality of that is pretty clear. Having said that, there's other things, the status crimes, which I find the most frustrating, which are uh, mostly trespassing. You have to be somewhere. You can't be here. And the answer is, where can you be? The, question, the answer is, over there in that gravel lot. ASU law professor Ben McJunkin is an expert in the enormous, complicated misdemeanor justice system and its effects on the homeless and indigent communities. For the average unsheltered Arizonan, the transformation from private citizen to defendant often starts with a 911 call. There's this sort of pervasive desire by the people who are inclined to call 911 um, to yeah, have homeless individuals sort of shuttled off somewhere else. And so much of the interactions that happen happen because police are compelled to respond to those calls and they're simply trying to you know, do their job by getting people to move along somewhere or another. Someone sees a homeless person doing something they don't like. Maybe they're panhandling or camping in an alley or sleeping on a bench in a park. Things the typical unsheltered person has to do to survive. They call the police, who are legally obligated to respond and investigate. In the course of that, they always they, they end up encountering things like drugs, or they end up encountering encampments that are in violation, or they end up encountering people who simply refuse to move. Right? And under those circumstances, often what ends up happening is an arrest. We hear the word arrest tossed around a lot. Here's what an arrest involving an unsheltered person typically entails. First of all, if an officer decides to make an arrest, uh, a couple things happen. Uh, if, the, if the individual has sort of property or possessions, especially if they've created sort of a temporary encampment somewhere, typically that stuff is left behind. The arrestee is handcuffed, searched, and their personal property is usually confiscated. The... Next thing that happens is if they do have some property that the police want to take possession of, uh, that actually gets logged in a way that makes it very difficult for homeless individuals to get back. You need an ID to claim property, and a significant population of unsheltered people don't have any identification at all. The next thing is, you know, if you do get arrested, right, you get brought in, you're going to be in jail for some number of hours, um, hopefully not days, but, but certainly some number of hours. Uh, you know, you get a mugshot, you get an arrest record. Next comes the bail hearing, where a judge decides how much money you're going to have to pay if you want to stay out of jail while your case works its way through the court system. Some places use a bail schedule, with fixed amounts for each charge. Others use a computer algorithm, and still others give the judge a lot of discretion. According to McJunkin, Arizona's system is actually pretty fair to most people, even those without any money. Arizona's actually been pretty good recently about reforming their bond policy so that they're working more on ability to pay rather than um, issuing a bond that holds people that can't afford it. If a person has a particular record or if uh, a judge is inclined to think that the person for whatever reason has resources um, or might be some kind of threat, then um, they can order you know, a cash bail, which a person might not be able to pay, and then they do have to stay in jail awaiting um, the resolution of their case. Right? So, it's possible that it can be, you know, a couple months if, if they were really in dire straits. But why take someone to jail and spend all that time and money processing them for something like trespassing or vagrancy? Can't officers just issue citations? 
the there's a state law in Arizona that gives police departments the ability to decide whether to issue citations for misdemeanors. And let's just put it uh, that's a simple way of describing it. There's a couple exceptions for domestic violence and some things, but uh, so each department has its own dis like discretion to issue misdemeanors. That discretion seldom benefits the unsheltered homeless. But they have field policies, field guides that tell officers what they should look for in deciding whether to use that discretion. And several of the things um, in those field guides cut against homeless individuals, right? So it, again, stuff like is that, you know, do they have ties to the community? Do you have reason to suspect they might not show up? Have they been able to show you a valid ID so you know who they are when you're filling out your citation? Uh, and so to the extent there's discretion, the discretion doesn't get, like it doesn't redound to the benefit of homeless individuals, right? It, it really works against them. About one quarter of misdemeanor cases in Arizona are dismissed, even after the defendant has been arrested, processed, and if they're unsheltered, likely lost most of their possessions. That raises all sorts of questions for Professor McJunkin. There's a chance, you know, a 25% or greater chance that your case gets dismissed and so all of this was for no reason whatsoever, right? There's no prosecution brought at all. There's no punishment. So if you're arresting people and putting them in behind bars only to decide that it wasn't worth your time in the first place, something's like deeply wrong with the system. Whether someone is arrested or given a citation, the 75% of defendants whose cases are not dismissed will next find themselves involved in one of the state's myriad municipal court systems. It typically takes about 90 days for cases to be resolved there. There are two important Supreme Court rulings at play here. The first is Miranda v. Arizona, and the second is Gideon v. Wainwright. You probably recognize Miranda from its well-known warning. Walter White, you have the right to remain silent. Anything you say can and will be used against you in a court of law. You have the right to an attorney. If you cannot afford an attorney, one will be provided for you at no cost. Now, do you understand these rights you just explained to us? Oh, yes. Oh, it is such a pleasure to deal with a professional. It's refreshing. The last half of that all-too-familiar warning, the part where it says if you can't afford an attorney, one will be appointed for you, comes from the Gideon case. That's why we have public defenders like David Ward, who heads the City of Phoenix Public Defender's Office. And contrary to the stereotype that the public defender is an inexperienced, fresh-out-of-law-school kid wearing his dad's suit, the city of Phoenix has a robust public defender's office that handles misdemeanor cases. The Valley is very good in that the contractors are not baby lawyers straight out of law school trying to find their way. Uh, most of our lawyers have 10 to 15 years of experience. Some of the best and well-known lawyers in the state are some of our CAAs. CAA means court-appointed attorney, by the way. Uh, some of the best DUI lawyers you've, you're ever going to hear about are uh, CAAs here. Uh, we've had people do felony murder cases on a regular basis, and then they'll take a break from that to come over to handle their you know, DUI case or their trespass case or whatever. So we have some extraordinarily good lawyers. So you'd think misdemeanor clients who can't afford to pay top dollar for a defense attorney would be well taken care of. Except, in certain misdemeanors, the right to counsel does not apply. If the prosecution isn't seeking any jail time, an indigent defendant is not entitled to a public defender. Someone with money and means can hire a private attorney, but someone without means and who isn't facing jail time for their offenses is not entitled to legal representation. That has serious implications for the homeless population. So constitutionally, if you aren't risking jail time as a punishment, right, if it's just a fine-based offense, uh, you're not entitled to your own lawyer in defense. Uh, and so you're talking about people who are undereducated, who don't have resources to hire their own lawyers, who aren't given lawyers by the court, um, who are facing this system where the prosecutor doesn't know anything about them and isn't about to sort of sit and hear their explanation because they've got a hundred cases they need to churn through that day. There's seldom time for trials in misdemeanor court, given the massive caseloads. The vast majority, upwards of 99%, depending on the source, are handled by plea bargain, regardless of the defendant's actual guilt or innocence. Out. This is one of the defining features of misdemeanor prosecutions is that it's basically assembly line justice. Uh, almost no one involved, including the lawyers, right? Almost no one involved has any idea what's actually happening. They don't know the underlying facts. They have about a minute to make a decision. Municipal court only has a few areas where you get a jury trial anymore. 
And so there's not as many jury trials as there used to be. And the only difference between jury trials in misdemeanor court and in felony court is that in misdemeanor court, you only have six jurors instead of 12. Research from across the country shows that many indigent defendants are pressured to take pleas by prosecutors. And without a defense attorney, many end up pleading guilty just because it's faster. So you'll have separate misdemeanor courts where uh, the officers who write the citation show up on behalf of the government. Uh, and, you know, so what ends up happening is people plead out in most of these cases. I mean, this is our system anyway, right? But uh, a plea agreement is reached without there being any kind of investigation into the underlying facts. Uh, people are sort of pressured to plead because it's very easy to stack charges. Um, you know, and so you say, okay, well, we'll drop the loitering charge and we'll only get you on the marijuana, even though you only found the marijuana because we arrested you for the loitering. Uh, and so what ends up happening is, yeah, there's, there's maybe minutes, um, literally minutes that are given to each individual case and simply understanding sort of who are you, what did you do, what will you agree to pay? On top of that, anecdotal evidence seems to show that many misdemeanor judges ignore due process rules to speed up disposition. They would tell defense attorneys to bring these issues up on appeal. But who's going to spend the money to appeal a loitering conviction? So one of my mentors uh, at Michigan did misdemeanor criminal defense, and her anecdotes were included judges who simply refused to hear arguments about, you know, illegal searches, unconstitutional searches. Uh, they decided it wasn't within their province to care about that and that you would preserve your objections that you can raise on appeal. You know, they're like, do that in another court after we take care of this, um, because it really is rapid fire, uh, quote unquote, justice, right? But it's really just resolving cases as quickly as possible. Um, getting people in and out with no individualization at all, and so therefore no appreciation for whether they've actually done anything wrong. David Ward, the public defender, spends a lot of his time in an Arizona courtroom. He says the system can pressure people to take plea deals, but he believes it's not as bad here as McJunkin's example. When you, when you bring a case in, is that we used to joke that oftentimes the biggest problem we have with a case is that you, you did it and the state can prove it. We do the very best. If there's a if there's if the state can't prove the case, then we're going to take it to trial. If we think there's a reason to go to trial, we're going to go. To, we would encourage you to go to trial. But sometimes there's nothing we really we can do at that. So then we have to change the gears and say, okay, let's try to get the very best deal we can get. Because sometimes people are overcharged. Regularly they're overcharged. You often see people charged with disorderly conduct and assault. You know, okay, well, let's get one, rid of at least one of those. Uh, let's see what else we can do. Can we negotiate a better deal? Uh, the very best deal we can get for you. It's it's unfair to say that uh, that people are just pleading deals, but it, it's probably accurate. Most and not just here, everywhere. Most cases are entered into a plea. In a lot of these cases, though, it boils down to one thing: the word of a law enforcement officer against the word of a homeless defendant who may have prior charges. Right. And I think that's one of the things that people don't fully understand is you think that you're going to get an opportunity to explain yourself. You think you're going to get an opportunity to raise a defense. You think you're going to get an opportunity to make an argument. And often none of that is given to you. Um, it really is sort of a separate, it's an entirely separate justice system, but uh, it's a justice, separate justice system that makes up 82% of cases in Arizona. Uh, so it is our largest justice system by far, even though it doesn't fit any of the paradigms we have for what criminal justice is supposed to look like. The gavel strikes, the sentence is entered into the record, and the defendant either becomes inmate or probationer. In our next episode, we look into the systems of probation and incarceration, as well as fines, suspensions, and the broad impact they have on the homeless and the poor. It turns out that to be on probation, you have to pay fees to your probation officers. Uh, in general, if it involves any kind of monitoring or drug testing, you pay the fines and fees to go to those things. Uh, and every small misstep that you make, including failure to submit your report, failure to notify your probation officer if you have any interaction with uh, a police officer, those end up being technical violations that get you hauled back into court, that potentially stick you back into jail. It's really difficult to get housing when you're on probation. You know, she has three years of probation, so it's going to be difficult to get housing for three years. Um, and so that was one of the times you realize, wow, probation really does have teeth. Uh, so many times people say, well, the guy got on probation. It was nothing happened. Well, a lot happens. 
uh, it marks you and it, it makes things difficult, especially if you're if you're marginal. Now I'm out in the street, and that's how I ended up out in the street. Um, you know, it was like all I could do was live in my car, and I had to take all of my cats with me, and we lived in the car. How long did you live like that? Eleven months. Eleven months. Yeah, almost twelve. You just listened to an entire podcast episode on the issue of homelessness in Arizona. Obviously, the issue is important to you. If you want to do something that helps make a difference, we have dozens of local, nonprofit resources listed on our website, hearearizona.org. That's H-E-A-R Arizona.org. You're sure to find something, big or small, that you can do to make a difference. An easy way to get started is to help us learn more about you, the listener, and answer a few questions about our episodes. It's as easy as texting the word podcast to 888-774-9150. You'll even get a free pair of earbuds for your time. You can also learn more about homelessness by listening to the rest of our Unsheltered series on your favorite podcast listening app, NPR One, Stitcher, Spotify, or by downloading directly from hearearizona.org. Don't forget to subscribe because there's plenty more to come. Here, Arizona is a production of the Division of Public Service at Rio Salado College, which includes Sun Sounds, Spot 127, KBOC, and KJZZ. This episode was recorded, written, and produced by me, Scott Bork. Linda Pastori is our executive producer. Thanks for listening. Hi, this is Scott Bork from Here Arizona Podcasts. Since you're still listening, you're obviously a fan of ours. We want to hear more from you. Visit hearearizona.org and take our listener survey. That's H-E-A-R Arizona.org. Thanks for listening.